a fragment of pure life, preserved in its purity, which we can only know when it is so preserved, because in the moment when we live it, it is not present to our memory, but surrounded by sensations which suppress it. just entered the courtyard of the Guermont mansion. In my absent-minded state, I failed to see a car which was coming towards me. As I moved sharply backwards, I tripped against the uneven cobblestones. And at that moment, a profound azure intoxicated my eyes. Impressions of coolness, of dazzling light, swirled around me. And in my desire to seize them, I staggered again. And again, the dazzling and indistinct vision fluttered near me, as if to say, Seize me as I pass, if you can, and try to solve the riddle of happiness which I set you. <laughs> it is sometimes just at the moment when we think that everything is lost, that the intimation arrives which may save us. One has knocked at all the doors which lead nowhere, and then one stumbles without knowing it on the only door through which one can enter which one might have sought in vain for a hundred years. And it opens of its own accord. Towards the end of Marcel Proust's prodigious work, A la recherche du temps perdu, the narrator is hurrying to a recital in post-First World War Paris, when a stumble recalls for him, inexplicably, a long-forgotten image from a visit to Venice. This trivial experience is a turning point in his life, which leads to a series of reflections on life, death, time and art. Above all, he realizes the crucial importance of memory in human life and perception. At that moment, a second intimation came to reinforce the one which had been given to me by the two uneven cobblestones, and to exhort me to persevere in my task. Trying unsuccessfully not to make a noise, I chanced to knock a spoon against the cup, and again that same species of happiness which had come to me from the uneven cobblestones poured into me. I wiped my mouth with a napkin, and a new vision of azure passed before my eyes, but an azure that this time was pure and saline and swelled into blue and bosomy undulations. For the napkin which I had used to wipe my mouth had precisely the same degree of stiffness and starchedness as the towel with which I had found it so awkward to dry my face as I stood in front of my window at Baalbek. And this napkin, now, in the library of the Prince de Gamont's house, unfolded for me, concealed within its smooth surfaces and its folds, the plumage of an ocean green and blue, like the tail of a peacock.
I understood clearly that what the sensation of the uneven cobblestones, the stiffness of the napkin, the sound of the teaspoon had reawakened in me had no connection with what I had frequently tried to recall to myself in Venice, Balbec, Combray, with the help of an undifferentiated memory. The truth surely was that the being within me which had enjoyed these impressions had enjoyed them because they had in them something that was common to a day long past and to the present. Because in some way they were extra-temporal, and this being made its appearance only when it was likely to find itself in the one and only medium in which it could exist and enjoy the essence of things. That is to say, outside time. And only this being had the power to perform that task, which had always defeated the efforts of my memory and my intellect, the power to make me rediscover days that were long past, the time that was lost. Open sesame. And no sooner had Ali Baba spoken than straight away the portal flew open and he entered within. A la recherche du temps perdu was originally translated into English by C.K. Scott Moncrief as Remembrance of Things Past, but it could more literally be translated In Search of Lost Time. It's the story of a man looking for a muse and searching for a way to communicate the relationship between the abstract notion of time we all share and the concrete way in which time is perceived by each individual person. Some piled upon the ground Instead of a conventional narrative, it uses a collection of memories to create a new form of fictional autobiography, releasing the novelist from his traditional role by using an invented character to look back at a life similar to Proust's own. Proust's narrator's early memories are of his family holidays at Combray. The robbers came in, and last of all, their chief. Albeit he was affrighted beyond measure of a fright. Jean, what are you doing with the boy up there? Dinner's about to be served. Can I just tuck him into bed and give him a good night kiss, dear? Good Lord, he doesn't need all that at his age. Monsieur Swan's arrived already and it looks very impolite. So come down at once. And suddenly my anxiety subsided. A feeling of intense happiness coursed through me, as when a strong medicine begins to take effect, and one's pain vanishes. I had formed a resolution to abandon all attempts to go to sleep without seeing Mama. I had made up my mind to kiss her at all costs. Even though this meant the certainty of being in disgrace with her for long afterwards, when she herself came up to bed, When I went to meet my mother, and when she saw that I had stayed up in order to say good night to her again, I should not be allowed to stay in the house a day longer. I should be packed off to school next morning. So much was certain. Very well. Had I been obliged the next moment to hurl myself out of the window, I should still have preferred such a fate. But what I wanted now was Mama to say good night to her. I had gone too far along the road which led to the fulfillment of this desire to be able to retrace my steps. But I don't think his philosophy will ever amount to much. Marcel's very intelligent. Did he? Didn't he like the Margaret novel that I lent him? Oh, he was absolutely fascinated by it. And of course, his grandmother is such a huge fan of the Noiselessly, I opened the window and sat down on the foot of my bed. I picked them myself. I hardly dared move in case they should hear me from below. I think the boy spends money. Outside, things too seemed frozen. Oh, what a lovely... Wrapped in mute intentness. You may return the books whenever the boy's finished with them. Good night, Swan. Good night, Monsieur Swan. Good night, Madame.
Presently, I heard my mother coming upstairs. My heart was beating so violently that I could hardly move, but at least it was throbbing no longer with anxiety, but with terror and joy. Mama, please come and kiss me goodnight. Off you go at once. Do you want your father to see you waiting there like an idiot? Please come and say goodnight to me. Please come. What's going on here? The boy's been waiting up all evening for me to kiss him goodnight. Go along with him then. You said just now that you didn't feel very sleepy, so stay in his room for a little. I don't need anything. But my dear, whether or not I feel sleepy is not the point. We mustn't let the boy get into the habit. There's no question of getting into a habit. After all, we aren't jailers. You'll end by making him ill, and a lot of good that will do. Stay with him for the rest of the night. Anyhow, I'm off to bed. Good night. So the morn began to dawn. She Never again will such moments be possible for me. But of late I have been increasingly able to catch, if I listen attentively, the sound of the sobs which broke out only when I found myself alone with Mama. In reality, their echo has never ceased. The mother's goodnight kiss at Combray is the most powerful memory of Marcel's young life. It's the crucial event uh, and it's the key and it will be reverted to throughout the whole novel. It's the key to, to, to Proust's painfully subjective psychology of, of love. He talks about this terrible need of a person and the insensate agonize, agonizing need to possess exclusively. Love as reassurance, as, as, as assuagement. This will apply to all his future relationships with women. One of the most important things Proust did for uh, our literature is to have shown the unclearness of conscience. If you wish, we can call that the unconscious side of our mind. In the French tradition, we have that idea of uh, clarity, a clearness, a transparency. But uh, Proust showed that our mind is extremely obscure uh, for, for us. And he says that that scene was always in the mind of the narrator. Uh, the narrator during all his life uh, went on crying and sobbing, but he didn't know that. And uh, he had to, uh, he needed a, a kind of a magic event in order to be able to understand that and to uh, leave them a second time. Discovery of an unconscious memory allows Proust's narrator to relive his past with a deeper appreciation of its significance. The setting for his important childhood memories is Combray, based on a small market town in the Loire Valley, originally called Ilier, but now renamed in honor of the novel. Proust's own family traveled from Paris to his aunt Leonie's house at Ilier every summer, until the boy's worsening bouts of asthma made long visits to the countryside impossible, and they became a remote childhood experience, a lost time. Proust's father was an eminent surgeon and professor of the Academy of Medicine. His mother, the daughter of a wealthy Jewish stockbroker. The young Proust was a voracious reader who'd read most of the classics by his early teens. His schoolmasters in Paris remarked on his brilliant and original prose style, and he studied at the Sorbonne, where 19th century cause and effect thinking was being challenged by Professor Henri Bergson's philosophy based on the ceaseless flow of the human mind. The precise, elegant style with its long, flowing sentences and the philosophy which explored how the mind itself worked were to combine into one of the longest and most thorough books ever written. 
Started in 1909 as a two-part novel, it eventually expanded into seven parts, published in 13 volumes, as Proust, driven by illness and dedication to his task, gradually retreated more and more to his cork-lined bedroom in Paris to revise and expand his manuscripts. He reworked the text obsessively until his death in 1922, gluing together long concertinas of amendments and additions as he strove for ever more profound insights into human behaviour and precise descriptions of his age. In his struggle for perfection, he often rewrote entire chapters as the printer's galleys were returned to him for final checking. The novel invites the reader to enter another person's mind, where a trivial experience, like the taste of a madeleine cake dipped in tea, echo across space and time. It is a fictional autobiography. Its narrator shares many points of similarity with the young Proust. Similar parents, similar holiday and townhouses, similar illnesses, and a similar love of literature. Though for most of the book he's nameless, Proust jokes that the reader may call him Marcel if he wishes. Two walks which both the young Proust and the young Marcel enjoyed start from Ilie Combray. In the book, they become powerful and complex symbols, representing two paths through life, leading in apparently opposite directions. The Guermont Way leads along the river, towards the country seat of the aristocratic Guermont family, whose age-old title, like the river, flows on through time. It represents high society, frivolity, and the traditional French Christian values of Proust's father's family. But it's the path towards the neighboring village of Mesegliz which has a more immediate appeal for the young Marcel and determines the course of his early life. That represents culture, spirituality, and the power of art to overcome time, values attributed to his parents' friend, Charles Swann, past whose estate it leads. Swann is a bourgeois who succeeded on his own merit an aesthete, an art historian, and like Proust's mother, an assimilated Jew. So the way towards Mes Eglise becomes known as Swan's Way. with the fragrance of hawthorn blossom. The hedge resembled a series of chapels whose walls were no longer visible under the mountains of flowers that were heaped upon their altars, while beneath them the sun cast a checkered light upon the ground as though it had just passed through a stained glass window. And their scent swept over me as anxious as circumscribed in its range as though I had been standing before the lady altar. And the flowers held out each its little bunch of glittering stamens with an absent-minded air and blossomed out into the fleshy whiteness of strawberry flowers. But it was in vain that I lingered beside the hawthorns, breathing in their invisible and unchanging odor trying to fix it in my mind, which didn't know what to do with it. Losing it, recapturing it, absorbing myself in the rhythm which disposed the flowers here and there with a youthful light-heartedness, and at intervals, as unexpected as certain intervals in music. They went on, offering me the same charm in inexhaustible profusion, but without letting me delve any more deeply. Like those melodies which one can play a hundred times in succession without coming any nearer to their secret. I turned away from them for a moment, so as to be able to come back to them afresh. And when I returned to the Hawthorns, I stood before them as one stands before those masterpieces which one imagines one would be better able to take in when one has looked away for a moment at something else. But in vain did I make a screen with my hands, the better to concentrate upon the flowers. The 
feeling they aroused in me remained obscure and vague, struggling and failing to free itself, to float across and become one with them. They themselves offered me no enlightenment, and I could not call upon any other flowers to satisfy this mysterious longing. For someone who's often thought of as a sickly intellectual, screwing away in a cork-lined room when he wasn't flitting around the aristocratic salons of Paris, uh, Proust had an extraordinary feeling for nature. Uh, nature seems almost to be a living character in the novel, uh, and he applies to it the same sort of psychological insights uh, and, the, and the precise, minute observation uh, that he applies to his people. Um, his prose is, is full of images and metaphors from the natural sciences, not only botany, but, but also zoology and geology and even physics and chemistry. Science, as we, uh, as we take it generally, is, uh, is not uh, sufficient. It's not, uh, you need absolutely to have also art, and you have to, uh, to meditate upon what made art and to find, to try to find new ways to relate all these aspects of uh, human, uh, human uh, thought. It's these avenues of thought that open up for Marcel on Swan's Way. The art lover, Swan, has persuaded his rich friends to adorn their houses with beautiful contemporary paintings. Like many of Proust's characters, he's based on a real person, Charles Haas, in this painting by Tissot. Swan encourages the young Marcel's reading and, friendly with artists and writers, seems to live in a world of culture and romance. But Swan has a more earthy side. He's made a scandalous marriage, and it's on the same walk that Marcel first sees the girl who becomes the focus of his adolescent desires, Swan's daughter, Gilbert. Marcel takes Gilbert's gesture for a sign of rejection, a misunderstanding typical of his early relations with women. Though they later become friends and play together in the Champs-Élysées in Paris, his ardor deters her and causes his first heartbreak. It's again on Swan's advice that Marcel visits the seaside resort of Baalbec, where he meets Albertine, the girl who replaces Gilbert in his affections and who agrees to take a room in his hotel for the night. ring the bell.
fragments of existence, withdrawn from time. These then were perhaps what the being, three times, four times, brought back to life within me, had just now tasted. But the contemplation, though it was of eternity, had been fugitive. And yet, I was vaguely aware that the pleasure which this contemplation had at rare intervals given me in my life was the only genuine and fruitful pleasure I had known. I remembered with pleasure because it showed me already in those days I had been the same. And this type of experience sprang from a fundamental trait in my character, as already at Combray I used to fix before my mind for its attention some image which had compelled me to look at it. Because I had the feeling that perhaps beneath these symbols there lay something of a quite different kind which I must try to discover. No doubt the process of decipherment was difficult but only by accomplishing it could one arrive at whatever truth there was to read. Whether I was concerned with the impressions like the one I received from the Hawthorne at Combray, or with reminiscences like those of the unevenness of the two steps, the task was to interpret the given sensations as signs of so many laws and ideas by trying to draw forth from the shadow what I had merely felt by trying to convert it to its spiritual equivalent. And this method, which seemed to me the sole method, what was it but the creation of a work of art? Already the consequences came flooding into my mind. First, their essential character was that I was not free to choose them. I had not gone in search of the two uneven cobblestones of the courtyard on which I had stumbled. And here, too, was proof of the trueness of the whole picture, formed out of those impressions with those unerring proportions of light and shade, emphasis and omission, memory and forgetfulness, to which conscious recollection and conscious observation will never know how to attain. As for the inner book of unknown symbols, which my attention, as it explored my unconscious, groped for and stumbled against like a diver exploring the ocean bed. If I tried to read them, no one could help me with any rules. For to read them was itself an act of creation. The English title of the book, Remembrance of Things Past, is rather misleading because it it suggests a conscious, voluntary summoning up of the past, whereas uh, Proust in, insists all the time that, that it's unconscious, involuntary memory that's the open sesame to the past and, and to the conquest of time. Uh, the unconscious is ubiquitous uh, in, in, in the novel. Uh, he, he, he talks about the the curiously alive and creative sleep of the unconscious. Um, but this isn't the only way in which he reminds us of Freud. Uh, it's absolutely extraordinary, considering that he didn't read Freud, to the extent, the extent to which he, his psychological insights seem to parallel Freud's. The preoccupation about unconscious, the obscurity of man's mind uh, for himself, uh, was quite general at the end of the 19th century, not only in Vienna, but in Paris also. Many, many uh, psychologists and writers were trying to explore uh, this, uh, dark, uh, these dark sides of uh, mind. And uh, Proust has made it uh, in a quite uh, original way. When we compare today Proust and Freud, we can see that each one explains very much the other. Uh, but it, for me, Proust is as important in, un in understanding really Freud 
seine Freude zu verstehen. Prost. At every moment, the artist has to listen to his instinct. And it is this that makes art the most real of all things. The impression is for the writer what experiment is for the scientist. With the difference that in the scientist, the work of intelligence precedes the experiment. And in writer, it comes after the impression. What we have not had to decipher, to elucidate by our own efforts, What was clear before we looked at it is not ours. From ourselves comes only that which we drag forth from the obscurity which lies within us. That which to others is unknown. The reality that the artist has to express resides, as I now began to understand, not in the superficial appearance of his subject, but at a depth at which that appearance matters little. This truth had been symbolized for me by that clink of a spoon against a cup, that starched stiffness of a napkin, which had been of more value to me for my spiritual renewal than innumerable conversations of a humanitarian or metaphysical kind. Along the Guermantes way, I used to dream that Madame de Guermant, taking a sudden capricious fancy to me, invited me to the Ducal Park. She would make me tell her all about the poems that I intended to compose. And these dreams reminded me that, since I wished some day to become a writer, it was high time to decide what sort of books I was going to write. But as soon as I asked myself that question, and tried to discover some subject to which I could impart a philosophical significance of infinite value, my mind would stop like a clock. My consciousness would be faced with a blank. I would feel either that I was wholly devoid of talent, or perhaps some malady of the brain was hindering its development. Is it because we relive our past years, not in their continuous sequence, day by day, that in a morning or afternoon, suffused with the shade of some isolated and enclosed setting, immovable, arrested, lost, remote from all the rest, and thus the changes gradually wrought not only in the world outside, but in our dreams and our evolving character are eliminated, that if we relive another memory, taken from a different year, we find between the two, thanks to vast stretches of oblivion, the distance that there would be between two separate universes whose substance is not the same. An inheritance in his late teens enables Marcel to enter the high society he's imagined in childhood. His introduction is helped by the friendship he makes with the young aristocrat, Robert saint louis Between the years of my Combray life and the years when I would go out to dine with Robert saint louis what a world of differences. I felt on perceiving them an enthusiasm which might have borne fruit had I remained alone and would thus have saved me the detour of many wasted years through which I was yet to pass before the invisible vocation of which this book is the history, declared itself. But Robert, having finished giving instructions to the driver, now joined me in the carriage. The ideas that had appeared before me took flight. They are goddesses who deign at times to make themselves visible to a solitary mortal. 
But as soon as a companion joins him, they vanish. And I find myself thrown back on friendship. Tell me, how right in thinking that I heard uh, Madame de Villeparisis say to your uncle that he was a Guermont? But of course, Palamé de Guermont. Well, surely not the same Guermont who have a place near Combray. I claim descent from Geneviève de Brevent. Most certainly. My uncle, who is the very last word in heraldry and that sort of thing, would tell you that our cry, our war cry, that is to say, which was changed afterwards to Passavant, was originally Cambrésis. <laughs> it's his brother who has the place now. La saint Lou could have spoken to me indefinitely about his family without helping me to get to the bottom of the pleasure I had derived from the fact that suddenly, set free from a homely bourgeois prison that had been spirited away as in a fairy tale, I was embarking on the Guermont way. How do you know the Chateau de Guermont? Have you visited it? Well, perhaps you know my aunt de Guermont, Le Tournouis, who lived there before. Well, no, but I have heard this. They have all the busts of the old lords of Guermont there, don't they? Yes, it's a fine sight, I can tell you. Between you and me, I, I look on all that sort of thing as rather a joke. But enough talk of pedigrees. Tell me what you thought of the new Bogot novel. Oh, well, it's all about that small patch of yellow, isn't it? A mere view of Delft. <laughs> The Guermont way leads Marcel, like his creator, Proust, to another notion of lost time. Time wasted in Parisian cafe society and in the world of the Faubourg Saint-Germain, the exclusive salons organized by rich, fashionable and powerful ladies of the French aristocracy. These salons encouraged the brilliant group of artists who were drawn to Paris around the turn of the century. Renoir was at the peak of his career, as was Monet, painting water lilies at nearby Giverny. Rodin was working in Paris, and the city was a magnet for younger artists such as Picasso, for composers like Debussy, Ravel, and Satie, and writers like Zola, Apollinaire, and André Gide, who founded the Nouvelle Revue Française, an influential literary magazine and publishing house, which was later to publish Proust's work. A la recherche du temps perdu describes Parisian society in meticulous detail, and the insight with which it portrays the artistic revolution that was taking place, as well as the psychological motivations of the people, the fashions, preoccupations, and social customs of the era, are hallmarks of Proust's work. From the naughty 90s to the First World War, Paris enjoyed the Belle Epoque, but Proust shows the city behind the popular image of the Folie Bergère and Moulin Rouge, a city where shop girls and boys could be bought for sex for a few francs. Proust was a homosexual, and the book makes a study of what he calls inversion, which he felt was so prevalent, but unrecognized in French society at the time. Many of the characters in the book have homosexual affairs. Baron Chalieu, one of Proust's major comic creations, reputedly based on the outrageous behavior of the poet Montesquieu, is tied and whipped in a powerful scene of the kind that Proust probably observed on his own visit to homosexual brothels. As a young man with money and wit, Proust was welcomed by the glittering salons of the Faubourg Saint-Germain and was able to observe and describe a ruling class in financial, moral and spiritual decay. The war of 1914 will give a big blow to that society. And one of the point is that the old aristocracy, is, which, is, which has so much prestige still, is losing it more and more. And uh, uh, it, its power is almost entirely imaginary and because they are poor. And the Jews, and the Jewish bourgeoisie is uh, very rich at that time and becomes more and more powerful. Uh, it's a very long uh, evolution. Uh, it comes, it took centuries to, to develop. But there is a crisis uh, at that time, and uh, uh, you have a symbol 
of it in the marriage between Robert de Saint-Loup, who is Germant Sway, and uh, Gilbert Swann, who is, of course, Swann Sway. And Gilbert is the rich daughter of a of an elegant Jewish society man, but who is despised in many ways by uh, high society. Proust is, I think, one of the most devastating critics uh, of high society. Uh, he's tremendously severe on the on on the cruelty and arrogance and fatuousness and mercenariness of, of all these knobs. Um, uh, in impeaching them, he, he usually does it, does it in a sort of deadpan, low-key way, which, which uh, sometimes rises to high comedy. Um, but he's often brutally sat satirical as well. The stories that people told escaped me. For what interested me was not what they were trying to say, but the manner in which they said it, and the way in which this manner revealed their character or their foibles. Or rather, I was interested in what had always, because it gave me specific pleasure, been more particularly the goal of my investigations. The point that was common to one being and another. If I went to a dinner party, I did not see the guests. When I thought I was looking at them, I was in fact examining them with x-rays. And the result was that when all the observations I had succeeded in making were linked together, the pattern of lines I had traced took the form of a collection of psychological laws in which the actual purport of people's remarks occupied but a very small space. But did this take away all merit from my portraits? which in fact I did not intend as such. If in the realm of painting, one portrait makes manifest certain truths concerning volume, light, movement, does that mean that it is necessarily inferior to another completely different portrait of the same person, in which a thousand details omitted in the first are minutely transcribed? From which second portrait one would conclude that the model was ravishingly beautiful, while from the first, one would have thought him or her ugly. A fact which may be of documentary, even historical importance, but is not necessarily an artistic truth. Distracted by his social life, Marcel despairs of ever creating a masterpiece of his own. Albertine comes to live with him in his Paris flat, where they embark on a relationship of ambiguous sexuality. As Albertine played, she knew and, I think, understood the joy that my mind derived at these first hearings from the task of modeling a still shapeless nebula. It seemed to me, when I abandoned myself to the music, that art might be real, that it was something even more than the nerve-tingling joy of a fine day or an opiate night that music can give. A more real, more fruitful exhilaration to judge at least by what I felt. It is inconceivable that a piece of sculpture or a piece of music which gives us an emotion that we feel to be more exalted, more pure, more true, does not correspond to some definite spiritual reality, or life would be meaningless.
But did not my room contain a work of art more precious than all these? Albertine herself. But no, Albertine was for me not at all a work of art. The pleasure and the pain that I derived from her never took the line of taste and intellect in order to reach me. Marcel's desire to possess Albertine completely becomes an obsession and he's tormented by fears of her lesbianism, which is unable either to prove or disprove. Though she's compliant, charming and subject to his whim, he can never trust her veracity and through this and her early death, learns the limits of his own power in love. I did not know then the nature of the lessons through which one serves one's apprenticeship as a man of letters. In this process, the objective value of the arts counts for little. What we have to bring to light and make known to ourselves is our feelings, our passions. That is to say, the passions and feelings of all mankind. A woman whom we need and who makes us suffer elicits from us a whole gamut of feelings, far more profound and more vital than a man of genius who interests us. The task before me would not end until I had achieved what I had so ardently desired in my walks on the Guermont Way and thought to be impossible. Just as I had thought it impossible that I should ever go to bed without seeing my mother, or later that Albertine loved women, though in the end I had grown to live with this idea without even being aware of its presence. For neither our greatest fears nor our greatest hopes are beyond the limits of our strengths. We are able in the end to dominate the first and to achieve the second. But was there enough time? And was I still in a fit condition to undertake the task? As some of the guests entered from the drawing room, the theatrical disguises of the faces awakened in me another notion of lost time. For a few seconds, I did not understand why it was that everyone appeared to have put on a disguise. In most cases, a powdered wig, which changed him completely. These were puppets bathed in the material colors of the years. Puppets which exteriorized time. Marcel. How are you? took me for Mama. And it's quite true, I am beginning to look very like her. She'll birth. It's been a long time. I heard you had a hard war. It was a wonderful letter that you wrote when Robert was killed at the front. Thank you. For me, it was the saddest moment of the war. Should we go and dine by ourselves in a restaurant? <laughs> yes, if you don't find it compromising to dine alone with a young man. <laughs> or rather, an old man. But how do you come to be at a party of this size? To find you at a great slaughter of the innocents doesn't at all fit in with my picture of you. But really, since you do sometimes emerge from your ivory tower, wouldn't you prefer little intimate gatherings, which I could arrange for you with just a few intelligent and sympathetic people? I should always like to meet. Young girls who could renew within me the dreams and sadnesses of my youth and grant me, on an improbable day, a single chaste kiss. Let me fetch my daughter. I'd so love to introduce you to her. She's over there, and I'm sure she'd make a charming friend for you. Darling? This is Marcel, your father's friend who I used to play with when I was a little girl. Enchanté. Time, 
colorless and inapprehensible time, so that I was almost able to see it and touch it, had materialized itself in this girl, molding her into a masterpiece. I thought her very beautiful, still rich in hopes, full of laughter, formed from those very years which I myself had lost. She was like my own youth. Was she not like one of those star-shaped crossroads in a forest, where roads converge that have come in the forest as in our lives, from the most diverse quarters? Numerous for me were the roads which led to Mademoiselle Salou, and which radiated around her. Firstly, the two great ways themselves, when on my many walks I had dreamed so many dreams, both led to her, through her father, Robert Salou, the Guermont way. Through Gilbert, her mother, the Miseglise way, which was also Swan's way. And then a new light, less dazzling, no doubt, than that other illumination which had made me perceive that a work of art was the sole means of rediscovering lost time, shone suddenly within me. And I understood that all the materials for a work of literature were simply my past life. I understood that they had come to me in frivolous pleasures, in indolence, in tenderness, in unhappiness, and that I had stored them up without divining the purpose for which they were destined, or even their continued existence, any more than a seed does when it forms within itself a reserve of all the nutritious substances from which it will feed a plant. And when I thought of those who would read my book, it seemed to me that they would not be my readers, but the readers of their own selves. It would be my book, but with its help, I would furnish them with the means of reading what lay inside themselves. For the writer's work is merely a kind of optical instrument, which he offers to the reader to enable him to discern what, without this book, he would perhaps never have perceived in himself. Yes, upon this task, the idea of time, which I had formed today, told me that it was time to set to work. It was high time. Certainly, uh, à la recherche du temps perdu is a, a very uh, impressive work. And all the, all the literature uh, after in, Fran in French, but not only in French, in, in many countries has been uh, changed. It's a, uh, it's a landmark and uh, we cannot, uh, we, we cannot uh, go without uh, it uh, now. And uh, what is the most important for me is the way uh, he shows uh, the reflection about art inside art. It is, uh, uh, it, it tells us what, what is the meaning of art. It, it explains to us why we read books, why we look at paintings, and why uh, we listen to music. And uh, it shows us that it is related all these activities which seem sometimes uh, superficial or uh, only uh, leisure uh, activities are absolutely essential and that they are uh, related to, uh, to our life and to our death. I think Proust is the most intelligent man who ever wrote a novel. Uh, it's an extraordinarily adult and sane intelligence um, and um, if he has a lot to say to us uh, I think he'll have just as much to say to the people of the 25th century uh, it, it, his book is one of the great masterpieces of fiction in the history of literature à la recherche du temps perdu is one of the great 
entrances or doors to the mind of next century. We begin only to read Proust. Would there be enough time to set down the observations for which my work would have to be constructed exclusively? And, capable of being used for the purpose of my work, I felt jostling with each other within me a whole host of truths concerning time, human passion, character, and conduct. In my awareness of the approach of death, I resembled a dying soldier, and like him too, before I died, I had something to write. But my task was longer than his. My words had to reach more than a single person. My task was long. The book which Marcel returns home to write is, of course, the book we've just read from. During the years between the First World War and his death in 1922, Proust became a virtual recluse, venturing out into the glittering social world he'd once inhabited, only to research material for the work to which his life was now dedicated absolutely. The two volumes which had been printed by 1919 were enough to win him the Prix Goncourt, France's highest literary award. The work was not published in its completed form until 1927, five years after his death. In all my desires, concentrated around a single dream, I might have recognized as their first cause an idea, an idea for which I would have laid down my life, and at the central point of which, as in my reveries during the afternoons when I used to read in the Combray Garden, was the idea of perfection. <laughs> 